Oh boy, I might be going against uh, my better judgment on today's show, but in the crosshairs today, I got a selection of cringeworthy 80s novelty tracks that are so bad, they're good. We're talking 80s fad tracks, songs by actors who probably should have stuck to acting, and some really seriously embarrassing performances. But on the other hand, some of these songs killed it on the Billboard Hot 100, so someone must have thought they were pretty good back in the day. Will you admit to liking them? We'll have to see. I have to admit, though, I'm a sucker for bad B-movies and bad B-songs. Is that a thing? Get ready for a quick trip into the quirky, the bizarre, and the truly awful. But be warned, after you go down this rabbit hole, you're never going to be the same again. Next on Professor Rock. Hey, music junkies. Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember the cheap rack toys that you begged your parents for at gas stations and such that broke like two minutes after you opened them, you're going to dig this channel of deep musical nostalgia. Make sure to subscribe below right now. I know you'll find something to dig on this channel. We've got great interviews coming up and some great stories. Also, check us out on Patreon. So today we're returning to a show on this channel that we haven't done in a long time. Uh, it's a program that covers the history of the odd the kitschy, uh, and sometimes the truly awful songs of the rock era. Sometimes good, though. It's usually based around songs that are a bit of a novelty, a bit of the bizarre, somewhat gimmicky. The show is called Novelty, My Dear Watson. But on today's episode, instead of covering just one song, I'm going to count down five. That's right. It's my personal five cringiest novelty tracks of the 80s. Admittedly, I actually like some of these. Songs that are so bad, they're good. See if you can guess which ones they are. A few of these are like the equivalent of Killer Clowns from Outer Space, and it's not really a bad movie. It's entertaining, and so are these. <laughs> Killer Clowns from Outer Space. It's crazy. So first up at number five, it's a song that took advantage of the phenomenon that swept arcades in the early 80s. Talking about Pac-Man Fever by Buckner and Garcia. Jerry Buckner and Gary Garcia were a parody slash novelty song duo from Akron, Ohio, who began recording in the early 70s. Their first musical success came with a local rock group that they formed called Wild Butter. <laughs> However, the band never got more than a bit of regional attention. Now, after Wild Butter broke up, Buckner and Garcia relocated to Georgia, and there they put together a successful run writing commercials and ad jingles. By 1980, they were back to their roots writing and producing original songs. Just in time for the latest pop culture sensation, Pac-Man. So Pac-Man, of course, developed in Japan and released there in May of 1980. The following October, it hit American arcades and started gobbling up quarters. As Pac-Man gripped the nation, Buckner and Garcia likewise became addicted to the game. Said Jerry in a quote, everybody was playing it, so we started playing it too. Well, we got hooked and we ended up sitting in there for two hours instead of going back to work. We did this for a while and I said, hey, let's do a song about this. Because we were doing a lot of jingles and making pretty good money, we thought we could get play here in Atlanta and get our names out there. The song Pac-Man Fever, it describes a guy that spends all his time at the arcade with a pocket full of quarters. Just about every part of the game is mentioned in the lyrics, like getting chased by ghosts and chomping up cherries. After his quarters are gone, the guy calls it a day, but he's already making plans to come back tomorrow. Of course, we all uh, experience that with Pac-Man and Frogger and Gauntlet and so many others. The song also contains some sound effects from the game, which were recorded off an arcade machine at a local deli. Now, according to Buckner, they sent sound engineers to the deli to get the effects, but when they did this, they also caught someone ordering a sandwich on tape. They all laughed about it, of course, and supposedly you can hear it in the song if you listen to it closely. Said Buckner, we obviously didn't want to include that in the actual record, but at the time, several people said they could still faintly hear it in the very beginning in headphones. That's how it started, and the rumor just spread around. I can't really hear it, but it did happen, so maybe. 
When they were recording it in the deli, somebody ordered a sandwich and they just caught a teeny bit of it and the very end of the sound effect. So that's his quote. I guess it's there. Check it out in headphones. Buckner and Garcia were just ahead of the Pac-Man trend, so by the time the game became a true phenomenon, they had already released Pac-Man Fever on a small label. One of their friends who was a morning DJ on an Atlanta radio station played the song just a few times on his show, and it was an instant hit. People were calling requesting it, and it got the attention of CBS Records, who signed Buckner and Garcia to a deal, and then issued the song as a single in December of 1981. Not long after, CBS requested a full album, get this, of video game songs. So Jerry and Gary started taking notes on popular arcade games like Frogger, Asteroids, and Centipede. The album, also called Pac-Man Fever, was finished in just two weeks and released in January of 82. A flurry of media coverage followed and uh, both the single and the album were hits. The single climbed to number nine on the Billboard Hot 100. As of 2008, Pac-Man, the single, has sold over two and a half million copies. After that, they did other ones like uh, Do the Donkey Kong and E.T. I Love You. However, neither could replicate the success of Pac-Man Fever. Man, I remember loving this song as a seven-year-old. How about you? Tell us in the comments. How's it going, eh? At number four, we got a couple of lovable hosers. I'm talking out Bob and Doug McKenzie with Take Off. Take off, through the great white north. Take off. Now, in real life, the McKenzie boys were actually Canadian comedians, Dave Thomas and Rick Moranis. Bob is played by Rick and Doug is played by Dave. It's Bob and Doug McKenzie, the two hosts of the SCTV running comedy sketch, The Great White North. Uh, the pair had around 40 original segments on SCTV, each around two minutes in length. Good day. Welcome to the Great White North. I'm Bob McKenzie. This is my brother, Doug. How's it going, eh? Care topic. The bit was initially created as just filler content. However, the duo became something of a pop culture phenomenon north of the border and, of course, here in the U.S. It's crazy. I was doing an impersonation of these guys the other day, and the people around me had no clue who Bob and Doug McKenzie were. They also had their own movie, Strange Brew, that came out in 1983. Okay. So that's our topic for today. But back in 1981, Moranis and Thomas released a comedy album featuring the artistic works of Bob and Doug McKenzie, also called The Great White North. The album, which featured the song Take Off and sold over a million copies across North America, uh, just a phenomenon. On the charts, the record entered the Canadian RPM at number three on December 12, 1981. The next week, it climbed to the number one spot and stayed there until January 23rd, 1982. In America, it actually reached number eight. Take Off is described on the record as the hit single section, <laughs> with guest vocalist Getty Lee of Rush taking the mic. It's not hard to see why. This is my brother, Doug. How's it going, Getty? Oh, it's going pretty good. Good day, eh? Good, good, day. good day. Getty was actually a childhood schoolmate of Rick Moranis and had a fun time doing the song with a comedy duo. Famously saying, hey, 10 bucks is 10 bucks. <laughs> After the guys asked if their lawyer had called them, of course. Did our lawyer call you? Yeah, I'm, uh, you know, 10 bucks is 10 bucks. Throughout the song, Bob and Doug trade jabs back and forth as usual while Getty handles the chorus. According to Getty Lee, the whole song was just spontaneous. He said, I went down to the studio and put it together in like 15 minutes or something. It was really just off the cuff. The producer said, here's the lyrics, have a go. The guys will be in the studio with you and you can just kibitz with them and we'll record everything. And Moranis and Dave Thomas, and they were in character and I was singing with a toke on. <laughs> it's absolutely brilliant. So this is crazy, but you know, for all the success that Rush has had in their multi-decade career, the highest charting single to feature any of the members of Rush wasn't even a Rush song. It's actually this one, Take Off. It peaked at number 16 here in March of 82. Rush's highest Hot 100 hit was New World Man that same year, and that came in at number 21. Of course, on the US mainstream rock charts, Rush would score several top 10 hits, of course, a couple of number ones. 
But it's kind of crazy that Getty Lee's biggest claim to Hot 100 fame here in America is Take Off. I love this song for Getty alone. I mean, what's not to love? It's, it's Getty Lee and it's <laughs> Bob and Doug McKenzie, right? So, like, take off to the great white north. As we get into our number three slot, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eye, where the glasses I always wear on here. You know, if you or your family are in need of glasses, prescription glasses or otherwise, I'm telling you, Zenny is your only choice. You can choose from hundreds of designs and you can get it for up to 80% off regular retail prices. With inflation out of control right now, there's no better time to take advantage of the deals that Zenny always has. Make sure to click on our info button to get this special price. All right, we've made it to the number three slot. And here, from 1985, this one led to a historic Super Bowl. For all you sports fans out there, I've got the Super Bowl Shuffle performed by the Chicago Bears football team, aka the Chicago Bears Shuffle and Crew. We are the Bears Shuffle and Crew. Brace yourselves for this one. It's pretty bad. Okay, I said earlier that some of these songs are so bad they're good, but this, in this case, this one's just bad. So you got to give the Bears credit on the gridiron. During the 1985 football season, the Chicago Bears had one hell of a year putting together one of the greatest seasons in NFL history. After reeling off 12 straight wins, the team would ultimately finish with a 15-1 record before they entered the playoffs. The Bears would then add two more playoff wins and a commanding Super Bowl victory over the New England Patriots. To help build momentum for this dream season and the Super Bowl, the Super Bowl shuffle was written by Bobby Daniels, Lloyd Berry, Richie D. Meyer, and Melvin Owens. Released in December 1985 on Chicago-based Red Label Records and distributed through Capitol, the Bears were still seven weeks away from Super Bowl XX. So this was a pretty confident move. Among the Bears players who performed on this track were quarterback Jim McMahon, running back Walter Payton, wide receiver Willie Galt, linebacker Mike Singletary, and of course, defensive lineman William the Refrigerator Perry. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I mean, everybody loved the fridge. The video also featured a cameo by Julia Kalish, wife of the Raps co-writer uh, Myers. She's the female referee who blows the whistle and throws a penalty flag in order to bleep out the word ASS. <laughs> the Super Bowl shuffles massive popularity in the Chicago area, coupled uh, with the video's heavy rotation on MTV, pushed the song up the Billboard Hot 100. And uh, it actually just missed the top 40 coming in at number 41. Surprisingly, it also earned a Grammy nod for Best R&B Vocal Performance Duo or Group. The Super Bowl shuffle would neither be the first time nor the last time a football franchise would enter the musical arena. 77 Broncos had Make Those Miracles Happen and the 84 49ers had We Are the 49ers. In the years after the Super Bowl shuffle, NFL teams would continue to come up with their own fight songs from the Seahawks, Locker Room Rock, and the blue wave is on the road. For the Raiders, Silver and Black Attack. Also the Rams, Ram It. And trust me, if you go down this rabbit hole, there's no going back to the way things were before. I think I may have been scarred for life after watching some of these to get prepared for this. Incidentally, probably remember that the New England Patriots responded to the Bears' Super Bowl shuffle with their own video called New England, the Patriots, and we. It's actually much, much worse. New England, the Patriots, and me. For the Super Bowl, MTV pitted the two songs against each other, playing the videos back to back, and the viewers then voted for the winner. The results came out in favor of the Super Bowl shuffle. But trust me, there are no winners here. <laughs> the Patriots and me. The Frigo B. The Defrost D. I didn't come here looking for a trouble. I just came to do the Super Bowl show. Coming in at the number two position, it's a track by comedian and iconic actor Eddie Murphy. Except on this song, he's not trying to be funny. If you lived through the 80s, you already know what song I'm talking about here. I'm talking about... 
party all the time. Party all the time. From the would-be musician's 1985 album, How Could It Be? By this point, Murphy's film career was definitely on the rise with roles in 48 Hours, Trading Places, and Beverly Hills Cop. And that would just be the beginning of a long and incredibly successful film career. Of course, he was on SNL. I'll shoot you myself. Eddie Murphy, Beverly Hills Cop. Music, however, was a category where Eddie Murphy was, um, let's just say, less successful. Even though How Could It Be was his debut musical studio album, Murphy had actually already released a novelty song in 1982 called Boogie In Your Butt, which appeared on his self-titled comedy album. I don't even know what to say about this one. Um, understandably, Murphy had a hard time convincing people to take his music career seriously, like most actors who attempt this. Party all the time, I mean, as catchy as it is, it didn't really make things easier for him in that department. She all the time. Ooh, ooh, ooh. It's kind of an example of just how cheesy 80s music is at its worst. I mean, oversynthesized, endlessly repetitive. The one thing that Murphy did have in his corner, though, was Super Freak Rick James, who actually wrote, produced, and arranged the track at his home studio on this one. He also sang back up on it. She lets her head down. She lets her body down. James at least gave the song a little music industry credibility, let's say. She's a super freak, super freak. She's super freaking now. The music video for Party All the Time features footage of Eddie Murphy recording the track with Rick in the studio. So I guess Murphy, who had agreed to host the MTV Video Awards, joked with the studio brass about playing his song's video. To his surprise, they agreed to play it. Except at this point, the song didn't have a video, so Eddie Murphy quickly threw the video together last minute, and MTV put it into heavy rotation. A funny side story to this one, though. When Eddie Murphy told comedian and actor Richard Pryor about this song and his album coming out, Richard Pryor bet Eddie Murphy $100,000 that he couldn't do a 100% musical album without any jokes. Eddie Murphy took the bet. However, according to Murphy, when Richard Pryor died in 2005, he still hadn't paid up on the bet. Although Eddie Murphy would take some grief over party all the time from the media. Actually did really well in the Billboard Hot 100. It entered the charts at number 82. And by its 13th week, it reached number two. It would stay there for three weeks. It was behind Lionel Richie's Say You, Say Me. Say you, say me. Party All the Time would also go on to number eight on the Hot Black Singles Chart and number seven on the U.S. Dance Charts. Eddie Murphy had another Billboard Hot 100 hit single in 1989 with the cringeworthy Put Your Mouth On Me. That one reached number 27. That was more of a joke, of course. Put your mouth on me. Beyond that, Eddie Murphy actually had an extensive singing career. He released three studio albums and contributed music to films he'd appeared in, like Coming to America from 88 and, of course, the Shrek franchise. He also did backing for the Bus Boys and appeared in Michael Jackson's video, Remember the Time. He actually was almost in We Are the World, is what the rumor was, but he was recording Party all the time at, at that moment. And this kind of made it safe for other 80s actors to record songs on the side, if you think about it. In 1986, Don Johnson, a Miami Vice fame, hit number five with Heartbeat, and Moonlighting star Bruce Willis got into the act in 1987 with Respect Yourself. <laughs> I have to admit, though, I had this single and I smile every time I hear it. It's really not that bad. I'm just giving it a little crap. All right, here we are. We've reached my number one novelty pick for uh, novelty songs from the 80s. And who can it be now? Well, it's a song that had a guest appearance on it, a very important one, which is really the only reason it was a hit. None other than Kennedy William Gordy, better known by his stage name Rockwell, with Somebody's Watching Me. Somebody's watching me and I have no 
Kennedy was born with some big shoes to fill as the son of Motown founder Barry Gordy. Initially, Barry didn't uh, have much faith in his son as a recording artist, but that didn't stop Kennedy from secretly securing a Motown record deal without his father even knowing it. The label proposed the name of Rockwell, and Kennedy agreed to it since he thought that he rocked well. <laughs> Describing the origins of Somebody's Watching Me in the liner notes of Motown's 1993 box set, Hitsville, USA, Rockwell said, and I quote, first came the music, the melody, and then the lyrics just spouted out of my mouth as if I'd always known them. As a Motown staff writer, I attended a weekly writer-producer meeting where I presented the song for the first time. It went over big. And yes, it actually won over his father. I always feel like Of course, an undeniable boost for the song came from one Michael Jackson, also his brother Jermaine. Rockwell's sister was actually married to Jermaine Jackson. According to Rockwell, one day while he was visiting with the Jackson family, he performed Somebody's Watching Me with just the rhythm track behind him. Michael liked it, according to him, and he started calling him family members and friends to hear the song. And Rockwell performed it multiple times until the room was filled with people. MJ then asked him, you know, who's going to sing the backing vocals? And Rockwell replied, well, why don't you sing them? Michael hesitated for a moment. Then he said, uh, yeah, I'll do it. Then Jermaine said, I'll do it too. Yeah, I always actually heard the rumor that they did it as a favor to Barry Gordy, but they did it. And the best part of the song is this. It's the reason it's a hit. Somebody's This was in 1983. Michael Jackson was the biggest star in the world. There wasn't a close second. He was at the height of his powers at this time. Truth is, at that moment in time, being the biggest star in the world, it didn't matter if the record was the sound of someone brushing their teeth for three minutes straight. Michael Jackson was on it. It would have gone top five. Somebody's Watching Me was released on December 27, 1983, and it entered the Billboard Hot 100 at number 73. Two weeks later, it was a top 40 hit, and by its ninth chart week, it peaked at number two, where it stayed for three weeks. At the same time, Michael Jackson's last single from Thriller, the title track, was also peaking on the charts, coming in at number four. Yeah, you heard that right. Michael Jackson Thriller actually charted below Somebody's Watching Me. <laughs> That's insane. Somebody's Watching Me also topped the R&B charts, Internationally, it did well. It reached number two in Canada, number six in the UK and Ireland, number five in New Zealand and South Africa, and number 12 in Australia. Rockwell's next single, uh, called Obscene Phone Caller, a true classic if there ever was one, <laughs> it helped him narrowly avoid one hit wonder status. It reached number 35 on the Hot 100. But let's be honest, he's still a one hit wonder because everyone knows the one song, they don't really know Obscene Phone Caller. All right, there you have it. My top five worst novelty tracks from the 80s, best. But what do you think? Do you agree with my picks? Which ones did I miss? Tell us below in the comments. Maybe we can cover some of the others down the road. Let me know what you think. Thank you so much for watching. Leave us a comment about these 80s novelty tracks. What are your memories of these songs? You remember, um, am I being too harsh here? I mean, you know, they're fun. Novelty songs are always fun. They're not gonna change your life, but they're fun to listen to. Uh, if you like our content, we invite you to subscribe below. We would love to have you as part of our community. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.